You're listening to the Faith Bridge Sermon Podcast. Pastor Dana and I have some questions that we're going to answer in postscript that you don't want to miss. But before that, let's listen to Pastor Dan as he preaches on how we share our faith. Let's watch that now. Well, good morning to you. I'm Dan Slagle. I serve as the care and missions pastor here at Faith Bridge. And today we are in part two of a sermon series that we're calling Shareable. And it's all about the importance of sharing our faith with an unbelieving world. Pastor Ken got us started last week in an excellent sermon in which he talked about why it's so important that we share our faith. And namely, you and I live in a broken, messed up world, irretrievably broken messed up world. And we believe that Jesus Christ is the answer. We believe that Jesus Christ is the only answer. And therefore, it is imperative that we take this good news with us to this world. Otherwise, there is no hope. Well, today we're going to switch gears just a little bit, and we're going to talk about the how. Today's going to be a very practical message. We're going to get down to the nuts and bolts of how you actually share your faith with another person, how you can use the Bible to do that. Last week, Pastor Ken told us that one of the primary reasons many Christians don't share their faith is because they don't feel like they know how. And so my prayer is, by the time we're done today, you'll feel like you have got a few more tools to put in your faith-sharing toolbox And as opportunities come your way, as you pray opportunities your way, you will feel equipped and in a much better place to tell people about Jesus. We're going to be making our way through various portions of the book of Romans. Go ahead and open your Bible to that book. It's in uh, your New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, our ushers are coming down the aisle. Just raise your hand. They'll be glad to give you one. And if you need a Bible feel free to take that one as a gift from us. Before we jump into the message, let's, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, how grateful we are that you are an unstoppable God, that there's nothing about this world that can hold you back. There is no difficulty, there is no problem, no challenge that will ever be bigger than you. And yet our world is filled with difficulties and problems and challenges. And it desperately needs to hear that you have reached out through your son, Jesus. As we look at your word today, we pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would come and be our teacher. Guide us into the truths that we need in order to be a more effective faith sharer. And we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It was uh, seven years ago this month, October of 2011. I was about a mile into what was supposed to be a six-mile run when all of a sudden every ounce of energy in my body vanished. I mean, just like that. I was depleted. Like a a wind-up toy. I was totally wound down. My arms and my legs felt like they weighed a thousand pounds. And there was nothing for me to do at that point but just sit down on the side of the road. I'm thinking to myself, what on earth is happening? I've never had an experience remotely like this. And then I start wondering about how am I going to get home? I don't know if I'm going to even be able to get up. I didn't have a phone with me. But after about 20 minutes or so, I started to revive just a bit. And so I got up and in a very plodding, slow manner, made my way step by step back home. Well, that event was a wake-up call for me. That event, combined with a few other things that had happened to me recently, convinced me I needed to go see my doctor. And so I did, went to see my primary care physician, who in turn then referred me on to a cardiologist. 
And the cardiologist put me through a whole battery of tests, stress tests and sonogram and this and that and the other thing, and then sat me and Becky down and explained to me that I had a uh, condition known as mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, as best I understand it, I'm no cardiologist, no, nor do I play one on TV, but as best <laughs> I understand it, uh, your blood flows from your heart through the mitral valve out to the rest of your body, bringing oxygen to the rest of your body giving you strength, giving you energy. Well, because my mitral valve was faulty, there was a backflow of blood. It wasn't going out like it should. It was pooling up in the chambers of my heart. And as a result, I was just incredibly fatigued. And he went on to explain that the only thing to be done for this was uh, surgery to correct it. And so we, uh, we, we made an appointment, and on that day, Becky and I packed our bags, went down to Methodist Hospital at the Med Center, and um, I was preparing myself for the first time I'd ever had surgery in my life. Pastor Terry, our, our prayer pastor, met us down there, and, and he prayed with us, and then they put me in a wheelchair and, and took me back into kind of a little a, a pre-op holding area. Cardiologist met me back there and he said, now Dan, before you go in for the surgery, there's one last procedure we need to do. It's called a transesophageal echocardiogram. He explained that they were gonna put me to sleep and then they were gonna put a sonar down my throat, get as close to my heart as they could so that they could determine precisely where the problem was. So when the surgeon went in, he didn't have to waste any time. He could go right to the problem. So. Out I go, and a little bit later, I start to come to, and uh, there's the cardiologist standing beside the bed, and once I was somewhat coherent, he said, now, Mr. Slagle, uh, explain to me one more time, why are you here? And I said, well, mitral valve regurgitation, you know, and he said, uh, your heart is perfectly fine, nothing, I didn't, there's no need for you to be here. Great. <laughs> so he puts me in a wheelchair and they wheel me back out to the waiting room where Becky and Pastor Terry are waiting. And of course, I'm still somewhat under the influence. And I remember saying to Becky, good news. <laughs> we are going home. And she said, you're drunk. What are you doing here? And at that point, she got up and went charging back into the pre-op area. The little, I remember the little receptionist saying, you can't go back there. She went back there. <laughs> and she and the cardiologist then engaged in what you might call an animated conversation. <laughs> culminating with him calling my cardiologist to figure out what is going on here. And the upshot of it all was they decided to give me a heart monitor, send me home, and uh, for the next 30 days, they watch my heart, and from that day forward, I've been fine. Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. I'll never forget Pastor Terry's response as we were leaving. He, he said, in characteristic Terry fashion, he said, I don't understand why we're all so surprised. I mean, isn't this what we've been asking for all along? <laughs> Touche, Pastor Terry. <laughs> now, I tell you that story because I think it serves as a good word picture, a, a, a good analogy, if you will, to support the truths that we need to share with another person about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but we live in a post-Christian culture. You know, we are now the minority. There was a day when folks just went to church. There was a day when folks just read their Bibles. That's not the case anymore. And people living in our culture now you know, look at the Bible and, it, you know, at best it's irrelevant, at worst it's confusing and perhaps even harmful. 
And so if our strategy to lead someone to Jesus is just to hand them the Bible and say, here, it's in black and white, read it for yourself, we're not going to get anywhere. That's not going to work. Instead, we need to be able to tell a story. We need to be able to paint a picture, a word picture, something that will illuminate the scriptures for them, something that will give them that aha, oh, that's what he is saying. Despite the fact that Romans, without doubt, is the clearest explanation of the gospel to be found anywhere in the Bible, for someone who's never read the Bible, it may as well be Greek. And so we need to be able to tell a story about that. And I've discovered that that particular story from my life serves me well when I begin to explain the gospel to unbelieving people. What we're going to do for the next several minutes is I'm going to share with you four essential truths, four things that every believer needs to know in order to share their faith effectively, four things that every unbeliever needs to understand if they're going to make a decision for Christ. And each of the four truths are going to be drawn directly from Scripture, directly from the book of Romans. Putting it mildly, having a bad heart is no fun. I mean, our our heart obviously is central to our existence. We can't live without it. And if it goes bad, it's, it's impacting every area of our lives. Quality of life, down. Energy, down. Work, no fun. Relationships suffer. It's difficult to think. It's not a good situation to have a bad heart. The Bible recognizes that in addition to having a physical heart that is central to our existence, we also have a spiritual heart. A spiritual heart that, that's the essence of who we are. You know, when you say to someone, hey baby, I love you with my whole heart, you're saying, I, I love you with all that is me, with the essence of me. The Bible recognizes that we have a spiritual heart. And when that heart is bad, just like the physical heart, it impacts every area of life. And furthermore, the Bible goes on to point out that each and every one of us have a bad spiritual heart. The biblical term for a bad spiritual heart is a sinful heart. And sin is anything, any behavior, any thought, any word that is contrary to the will of God, to his good and perfect plan for our lives. Anything that causes us to break fellowship with God is sin. And we all have this condition called a bad spiritual heart, a sinful heart. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul could not be more clear. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is endemic to the human experience that we are broken, sinful creatures. And it's important to note that uh, unlike my physical condition, where I bore no responsibility for my bad mitral valve. I I never did anything that caused that. It was just an unfortunate occurrence in my life. Unlike that situation, when it comes to our bad spiritual heart, we are most certainly responsible. Because we have all made a conscious choice along the way to step outside of God's will for our lives, to engage in behaviors that are not in keeping with what he wants us to do and how he wants us to live. From the smallest little white lie to the most heinous, horrible thing that anyone has ever done, it all counts as sin and it all has the same impact. It all separates us from God. First fundamental truth, Romans 3.23, all of us are in the same boat. And it's our fault. 
We can't point the finger at anyone else. We can't say the devil made me do it. No, we have to own it. Our spiritual heart is a mess and it's our fault. A bad heart always leads to death. Always. Now, my mitral valve situation was not emergent. It wasn't like I was having a heart attack or anything. No, we were able to schedule an appointment for surgery to get it repaired. But if I had left that thing unattended, eventually it would have killed me. My heart was malfunctioning and death was the only possible outcome. And in a similar fashion, the only possible outcome of a bad spiritual heart is death. Death. Romans 6, 23. Flipping the page here. For the wages of sin is death. The cost of living a sinful lifestyle is that we are going to die. Not just a physical death, but also a spiritual death in the life to come. We will experience separation from the source of life, from God Almighty. It will be an existence apart from the presence of God, which can only mean death. Now, why, you may wonder, does it have to be that way? What's the deal? Well, you have to go all the way back to the very beginning, to the first two human beings, Adam and Eve. God brought them into existence so that they might enjoy life. And he explained to them very clearly, I am the source of life. The the only reason you're here is because I created you, because I want you to be here. And as long as we stay in relationship, as long as you're connected to me, as long as you walk in obedience to my good and perfect plan for your life, you will have life. But the moment you choose to go your own way, to be disobedient, to disconnect yourself from the source of all life, you're going to die. That's just the way it works. And just like Adam and Eve, all of us have said at some point in time, you know, I think I've got a better idea. Now, I I know that God has other thoughts, other plans, but I think I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And that is what separates us from God. That's what breaks fellowship with God. And once that fellowship is broken, we've pulled the plug in essence. We've separated ourselves from the source of life and the only possible outcome is death. And we can't do anything about it. I was utterly powerless to heal myself. Couldn't fix myself if I wanted to. Even if I had the knowledge, of course, I couldn't operate on my own heart. And when you and I choose to separate ourselves from God and walk down that path toward death, we can't do anything about that either. There's no turning around and going back on our own. Things are going from bad to worse here, folks. Not only do we have a bad spiritual heart, that's our own fault. Truth number one. Truth number two, it's gonna kill us. And we can't do anything about it. It's gonna kill us in this life and it's gonna kill us in the life to come. When that doctor sat me down and gave me the diagnosis, mitral valve regurgitation, I had one overwhelming thought on my mind, just one. I need to find somebody who can fix me. I need to find someone who can do for me what I cannot do for myself. And thanks be to God, right here in Houston is the very surgeon who perfected the cutting edge technique to repair the mitral valve. He's known the world over for this particular procedure. And so that's who I made my appointment with. I knew this is the man who can save me, quite literally 
save me. And in a similar way, you and I desperately need someone to save us from the spiritual death that is looming, that is coming our way. Someone who can do for us what we could never hope to do for ourselves. And the good news is this, that person has come. And he is available to anybody. To anybody who would want to, you don't even have to make an appointment. He's there for you. And his name is Jesus. Jesus came to this world with a heart full of love for all of us broken hearted people. And he did something for us that we could never hope to do for ourselves. You know, we, we had disconnected ourselves from God by being disobedient. But for 33 years, Jesus was obedient. He never broke fellowship with God. And then he presented himself to God, and on our behalf, he said to God, I've done what they could never do. And by rights, I should just come right back to you. I've certainly earned it. But Father, I love them, and I don't want them to die. And so I'm going to substitute myself for them. I, I'm going to pay that price that they can't pay. I'm going to die for them. And he did a terrible death on a cross. And then to demonstrate that that sacrificial death on our behalf was acceptable. Three days later, God raised him from the dead. As we were singing earlier, he is alive. And as the one and only person in history to conquer death, Jesus now turns to all of us who are facing a certain death and says, come on, come with me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Amen. If you want to find your way back to life, if you want to reconnect with God, you got to connect with me. Amen. And that's truth number three, my friends. Romans 5, beginning in verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone may possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't say, get yourself cleaned up. Jesus didn't say, put in a little more effort. Jesus didn't say, show me that you can keep up. No, Jesus said, you can't do it. I know that and you know that. So I'm going to do it for you. And if you want life, if you want to know God, I'm the way. I'm the way. The news is getting better, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus has come to do for us what we could never hope to do for ourselves. And if all of that were not good enough, you know, getting my physical heart fixed was not an easy thing to do. You know, there were doctor visits and there were a battery of tests and there was insurance and there was insurance and there was insurance. I had to be approved. It was a hassle. But getting our spiritual heart fixed is the easiest thing that we will ever do. Because all we have to do is own that it's broken and that we can't do anything about it. but recognize Jesus has done something about it. And invite him to reconnect us with God. 
as we enter into a relationship with him. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse nine. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Thanks be to God, getting my physical heart proved, uh, fixed proved to be a whole lot easier than I ever imagined it would be. But it's even easier, friends, to get our spiritual heart fixed. Jesus is waiting, simply waiting for us to indicate, I want you to do this for me. I need you to do this for me. I stand in need today. And when the four truths that we've outlined here in the last few minutes come together, friends, you've got the gospel right there. I'm a brokenhearted individual separated from God, and it's my own fault. I'm going to die because of it, and I'm powerless to stop it. But God has made a provision for me, and his name is Jesus And Jesus has done for me what I could never do for myself. He offers me life. And if I will simply ask him for it, believing that he'll give it to me, he will. That's the gospel. That's the good news that we have to take to a broken, messed up world. Now, It probably won't be the case that every time you share your faith with someone, you're going to have the opportunity to close the deal, to be the one who actually leads someone to Jesus. But you just might. And so you need to be ready. You need to know, you need to understand your faith. And I can't make it any more simple than I've tried to this morning. It's not that complicated to begin with. I think we make it much more complicated than it needs to be. But if we will take hold of these four truths and present them with our story, it can change a person's life. Now, perhaps you're thinking, well, Dan, I I don't have a cardiologist story to tell. You and Pastor Ken seem to have cornered the market on that (laughs) whole thing. Well, you don't have to have a cardiology. All you need is your story. If you know Jesus, you have a story. And all it takes is sitting down for a few minutes and thinking through. What is my story? How would I articulate it to someone else? Because I'll tell you, friends, before someone is going to buy into the propositional truths found in this book, they're going to want to see those truths lived out in your life. And they're going to want to hear about it. Your story. So let me give you a very simple model for telling your story. Three questions. If you can answer these three questions, you got a story. Number one, what was my life like before Jesus? Who was I? How was I living? Number two, how did I come to know him? What were the circumstances? Who introduced me? What was that moment like when I said yes? And number three, how has my life been different since that day? If you can answer those three questions, you've got a story. And if you can take that story and use that story to support and illuminate the truths of scripture, you've got an excellent chance of welcoming someone into the kingdom. And that, my friends, is what shareable is all about. Taking what we have and giving it to someone who does not. It occurs to me that there may be someone here today And for the first time in your life, you're getting it. You're suddenly realizing, that is what church is. That's what the gospel is. 
And friend, if that's you, I don't think you're here by accident. No, I, I think you came here today for a divine appointment. I think the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and wanted you to be here to hear this good news. And in just a minute, I'm going to pray. And at the beginning of that prayer, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that you can step into that relationship with Jesus. Thinking about the four truths we've talked about here this morning and recognizing that he is the answer. He's more than ready to step into your life. Others of us uh, know this gospel. We've received this good news. We know Jesus, but we haven't been too keen on telling other people about it. We've been keeping it in here when it's desperately needed out there. You know, from time to time I hear folks say, oh, I, I believe faith is a strictly private matter. I don't try to make a show of it. As I read through the scriptures, I never heard Jesus talk about privacy. And I never heard him talk about being too worried someone would make a show of it. No, what I heard Jesus say was, go, tell, share. And maybe the commitment that you need to make this morning is a commitment that, yeah, I, I am going to tell someone. I'm going to be in praying that God will open my eyes to the lost people that are all around me and with his help, I'm going to see these divine appointments when my story, bam, it's what needs to be told. Twelve men turned the world upside down. And the only reason you and I are here today is because those twelve men were willing to share. Can you imagine what would happen if the sum nearly 4,000 people that will be here today did the same thing the world has yet to see. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to pray first of all for anyone who's here this morning that is having their aha moment. Their eyes have been opened and the gospel is suddenly clear. They've heard it in a way they never have before. I pray, Lord, that this would be the moment. And wherever you are, seated wherever you are, all you have to do is simply say, Lord, I know I am lost and broken without you. Please, save me. Save me from myself, from my sin. Forgive me for the dumb, sinful things I've done and make me one of your own. That's really all it takes. And for those of us who know this gospel, but for whatever reason, we've just been reluctant to talk about it. Lord, I pray for an infusion of courage. I pray for an infusion of compassion that we would understand there is no hope apart from Jesus and we're carrying within us the greatest news the world has ever heard. Oh God, light a fire under us that our heart's desire would be to go and share. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us first. And we offer our prayer in the strong, strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle, young and old pastor here at Faithbridge. We have some great questions in. One of them in particular is really relevant to a lot of us. I'm sitting here with Pastor Dan who just preached the second part in the shareable sermon series. And so we're just going to dive into the questions if that's good with you. Yeah, cool. Go. We're going to start with the easiest one first. Okay. Um, can you repeat the three questions you spoke on today? Sure. Uh, referring to the testimony, the, yes. the development yes. of a person's testimony. Yeah. What was your life like before you knew Jesus? Mm -hmm. How did you come to know him? And how has your life been different right. since you encountered him? Uh, just a simple little model, but if we will answer those questions, we can build for ourselves a good, you know, solid testimony that doesn't have to be theologically profound or overly dramatic. It yeah. can be an elevator speech so far yeah. as that goes, but it uh, encapsulates what our experience has been. Yeah, that's so good and so helpful. I know for me, it was helpful for me just to write out those questions and then like just fill them in on a piece of paper. Yeah, so, um, so few people think through that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a testimony. Mm -hmm. They just haven't taken the time to think about what it is. Exactly. Well, cool. Well, our second question that we have in is, uh, Pastor Dan talked about describing your life before and after you met Jesus. What advice would you give somebody who has known Christ their entire life? Um, common question. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Ken could relate to this question. He has been a believer since he was just a, a small kid and mm -hmm. probably doesn't have a lot of conscious awareness of his life beforehand. Instead of scrambling to find an answer to that first question, I, I would just then pick up with, you know, I really can't remember a time that I haven't known him. Yeah. It was my mom who led me or my Sunday school teacher, wh whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. But uh, simply say, this has been a part of my experience throughout life. Mm -hmm. However, I have taken some time and reflected on where my life might have gone if I hadn't yeah. have met him. Uh, it, it has presented enough struggles having known him. Mm -hmm. it, it probably would have been a lot more challenging and difficult if mm -hmm. I had not. But then just go from there and describe the quality of your life today. What does it mean to you to know Jesus? Yeah. And how has knowing him throughout your life been a significant part of your life? Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's so um, um, tempting to for for some of us that, that have been in the church their entire life. Like, I don't really have a testimony. It's like, no, you have the testimony that we all wish we had. That exactly anybody that came to know Jesus after a child, like, man, we wish that we had known him all our entire life. Like, for sure, such a gift. Yeah, speaking as someone who who did not come to know mm -hmm. Jesus until I was an adult, many times I've wished. I had the yeah. other testimony because uh, life apart from Jesus is is not not good, yeah. and um, there were some foolish choices and um, decisions that I I think I could have avoided. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, our third question that we have is um, it says you said we are all sinners by our own choosing, but everybody is born this way, right? Adam and Eve made the choice for me and everybody else, right? So, on the one hand, yes, we are sinful creatures. Mm -hmm. It's not merely a matter of what we do. Mm -hmm. we, we are born sinful. However, that does not release us from culpability. Mm -hmm. if, if we carried that out to its logical conclusion and believed that we were not responsible, we were just born this way, then there would be no need for a court system. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we recognize, even secular people recognize, regardless of circumstances, you are still responsible for your behavior. 99% mm -hmm. uh, of most parents understand <laughs> this. Yeah. You still hold your child responsible for their behavior, even though you may be perfectly aware they were born a sinful creature. Mm -hmm. You don't back up and say, well, okay, yeah. we, we'll, we'll just let that slide. No, uh, we have to take responsibility. And then two, I would say, 
even if, you know, we grant, yes, we are sinful creatures, there have still been those moments in all of our lives where we had the opportunity to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. We knew the right thing, mm -hmm. but we consciously chose to do the wrong thing, mm -hmm. going against everything we've been taught, going against our conscience, mm -hmm. um, going against uh, perhaps what we have learned mm -hmm. uh, through scripture or even through just a good upbringing. Yeah. Uh, all of us have made that decision. And so I think a case can be made that completely apart from our sinful nature, we're still responsible for our behavior. Right. Yeah, that's so good. Well, thank you, Pastor Dan, for a great message. Sure. It was helpful for a lot. And thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you again back next Sunday for Fun Day Sunday. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.